Mary Wollstonecraft was a famous early feminist in the late 18th century. She wrote a book, Vindication of the Rights of Women, in which she claimed four things. Women should be educated. Women can be rational. Women can master the same subjects that men can. And wives should be partners and not servants to their husbands. What's not as well known is that in the 18th century, there was a Jewish woman who made some similar claims. Uh, she could have been Mary Wollstonecraft's grandmother. We don't have a picture of her. She was born sometime in the second decade of the 18th century. She lived in southeast Poland. We do have pictures of two Jewish women who lived in the same time around the same place that she lived. We can see them now. They are Elia and Heike Lewowski. They were rather wealthy. Maybe Our Lady wasn't dressed like they did. We also have a little booklet, an eight-page booklet, that the woman I'm going to speak about wrote. You can see on the screen, this is a booklet that contains a trina, a supplicatory prayer that is supposed to be said on the Shabbat before the new moon, before Rosh Chodesh, every month. The lady who wrote this booklet, as you may be able to see, was named Sarah Rivka Rachel Leah Horvitz. What was interesting about this booklet was, first of all, it was written by a woman. Secondly, it's in three languages in only eight pages. Most important is the Tekhina prayer, the prayer to be said in the synagogue in Yiddish with an Aramaic translation and a Hebrew introduction. So this little booklet has more than one audience. The Yiddish prayer would be said by women in synagogue. The Hebrew was addressed to rabbis. And the Aramaic, I think she was just showing off. That is, she was showing that a woman could write in Aramaic, a language that most men in the 18th century would not have been able to understand. Leah was writing against a very old idea. The idea was, how do women gain religious merit? This is a question in the Talmud, and the answer through, from the Talmud through the Middle Ages and early modern period is the way women gain merit is by helping their husbands and their sons study Torah. In other words, a woman's job is facilitation. She is a helper. She is not the performer of the religious acts. She is the one who supports. And this disturbed Leah. And she wanted to prove that another rabbinic saying, that is of Rav Acha, that redemption will only come thanks to the merit of women, that that is what is important, that women bring the redemption. Women are active. And how did she want to prove that? Well, she said there are three areas that women are active in religiously, or should be active in religiously. One is study of Torah. The Talmud says that the crown of Torah is set out for anyone to come and pick it up. Well, for Leah, anyone means also women. And she says to those rabbis, don't disparage me because I'm dealing in Torah and I'm writing a prayer. You should be thanking me. You complain that women talk in the synagogue. Well, what else would they do there if there aren't any prayers for them to say? I'm giving them something to do there. So women should study Torah. Secondly, women should be in the synagogue to pray morning and evening. First of all, there's a verse in the Torah, in the book of Shemot, Exodus, that says when the tabernacle, the Mishkan, was constructed in the desert by the Israelites, the women who were gathered outside the tabernacle donated, donated their mirrors to be used to fashion the kior, the holy basin. Some of the commentators say, what were those women doing congregated outside 
the Mishkan? The answer is, they were praying. Women were praying already in the desert, publicly praying. In addition, the prophet Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu, in chapter 31, tells us that when the final redemption comes and all of the house of Israel will be ingathered back to Eretz Yisrael, to the land of Israel, bivchi yavau, they will come with crying. In other words, in order to be redeemed, we have to sincerely cry. Well, who cries better than women, Leah says. We need women in the synagogue to cry morning and evening, and their tears will open the gates of heaven and lead to redemption. Thirdly, there are 613 mitzvot, commandments, religious obligations, 365 negative, lo ta'aseh, don't kill, don't steal, and 248 positive, things you must do, honor your parents, observe Shabbat, etc. However, Maimonides, the Rambam, tells us that since the temple was destroyed, only 60 of the 248 positive commandments still apply to individual Jews. 60. There is a halachic maxim. Women are exempt from all mitzvot, all commandments that are time-bound and positive. That is, things that you must do at a certain time. Women are exempt from those. And most people say that thinking women must be exempt from many commandments. Even some rabbis we've found have said women are exempt from most commandments. Well, Leah didn't like that. She said, let's count. Of the 60 positive commandments, women are only exempt from 14. So women must perform 46 out of the 60. In addition, they have to perform 365 negative commandments. That means women have 411 commandments. Men have 425. So what's the big deal? Women have almost as many religious obligations as men. They are not only facilitators. They are doers. They are performers. Now, in her time, Leah had almost no resonance her uh, booklet was reprinted many times, but only twice with the introduction where she made most of her claims. In other words, the authorities at the time weren't interested in what we would call her uh, pre-feminist ideas. However, at the same time, other things were happening which were in the same direction as her ideas. For example, the whole idea of a Ezrat Nashim, a women's section in the synagogue. We can trace from the Middle Ages when women were more or less guests in the synagogue that would come in temporarily for special occasions, hearing a sermon, hearing the shofar, hearing the priestly blessing. And then we move to what's called a Weibershul, a women's synagogue, which is really a separate structure or perhaps the seller of the synagogue. In the period we're talking about, the 17th and 18th century, women are in the building. That is, the same roof is over the women's section and the men's section. Women are in the building, and even in a few places, women are in the room. What does that mean? The women's section has a ceiling over it, the same ceiling as the men's. And this is something that... Uh, Vladimir Levin has demonstrated in his research. So women are in the synagogue. They have a place there. They also are getting a liturgy to say, such as Leah's booklet and other collections of Tekhina prayers for women to say in the synagogue. Thirdly, there is a Yiddish library that starts developing from the 16th century, the 17th century, the 18th century, which is accessible to women because although they didn't get much formal education and wouldn't have known Hebrew or Aramaic, with exceptions like Leah Horvitz, 
they would be able to read or listen to, have read to them, books in Yiddish. And there are many, many published in these centuries. And finally, there, are, there is the codification of halachic expedience connected to marriage to improve women's status in marriage that we can't go into in, with our time limitations now. If you see what's going around us today, you can see that ultimately, Leah's ideas did have resonance. Women today are studying Torah on the same level as men and participating in the worship service in many places uh, on an equal basis with men.